I'm Chris Kimmel with Humanity in Deep Space. Uh, these webinars are an attempt to bring together uh, a lot of really interesting ideas and concepts and people that explore how we as humans are going to survive and thrive uh, in deep space. Um, going into deep space, leaving our planet is in fact a planetary issue and problem. And we're very proud of the fact that our webinars not only attract uh, hundreds of people uh, in attendance, but also generally people from 25 to 30 countries uh, all over the world. And so we are in fact beginning to gather together and, and get the ideas and in participation uh, of people from around, around this planet, which is, is very, very important. Welcome to Humanity in Deep Space, Episode 7, Seafaring to Spacefaring. A unique conversation with three former naval officers, including the captain of a deep water nuclear attack submarine, surrounding historical maritime experiences and exploration as an analog for deep space exploration. Our guests include Rachel Costello, whose 30-year Navy career included key posts both at sea and ashore as principal advisor to chief of naval operation and the master chief petty officer of the Navy, command master chief of the Arleigh Burke destroyer, Search and Rescue Squadron, and Enterprise Carrier Strike Group. As Senior Technical Project Manager at Tesla Incorporated, she led numerous large-scale projects worldwide, including Gigafactory One in Nevada, the launch of a $1.2 billion government compliance program, and a $37.5 million education and workforce development initiative. Retired Navy Captain Scott Tate served a 27-year Navy career and is now executive director of the National Security Innovation Catalyst, located at UC San Diego. The Catalyst pursues two related lines of effort, improving the transition of innovative commercial technology to national security users, and providing practical, effective policy recommendations to improve U.S. national security competitiveness. In addition to his leadership of Catalyst, Scott is CEO of Pacific Science and Engineering, a San Diego-based technology company that designs science-based human-machine interfaces for complex and high-consequence systems, including space, aerospace, autonomy, decision support, and electrical grid management. And Vice Admiral Robert Thomas, who retired from the U.S. Navy in January 2017 after 38 years of naval service. As a career submarine officer, he served and commanded fast attack submarines, operating in both the U.S. Pacific Command and U.S. Central Command theaters of operation. He then accepted an appointment as Senior Research Fellow at the University of California's Institute on Global Conflict and Cooperation. He is also a full-time faculty member at UC San Diego's Graduate School of Global Policy and Strategy. His final assignment before retiring was Director of Navy Staff in the Pentagon. Humanity in Deep Space is moderated by Chris Kimmel, founder of Humanity in Deep Space, and co-founder of Space Tango. Hello, my name is Chris Kimmel with Humanity in Deep Space, and I'd like to welcome all of our listeners today and, and viewers uh, to another episode of our webinar uh, on Humanity in Deep Space. Uh, first of all, let me thank again, as we always do, the sponsors, which make all of this possible, not only the webinars, but the initiative itself, Humanity in Deep Space. Uh, and uh, I'll go ahead and thank those people. One is the lead sponsor, Kentucky Science Technology Corporation, uh, National Stem Cell Foundation, the Solar System Exploration Research Virtual Institute at NASA Ames Research Center in California, uh, the START program, Space Tango, Baird uh, Wealth Management, the Shelgren Center, uh, Higher Orbits Media Collaboratory, and 22 Solutions. Uh, and these are the, the primary sponsors that make all of this all of this possible with their financial support, but also their, their backing uh, just in general. So I very much appreciate uh, uh, all of them. Um, we have, uh, I think, a really interesting session today. Uh, I've gotten to know the pa these panelists pretty well over the past uh, uh, several months. And uh, before we get going, I'm going to ask every, all of them to introduce themselves. We've got two on. We've got Rachel is going to be joining us hopefully here in a second. She was having a little trouble getting on. But let me start with uh, ask Robert to introduce himself and then Scott. Robert? Sure. Robert Thomas. Uh, I'm currently a faculty member at the University of California, San Diego's 
Graduate School of Global Policy and Strategy. I teach security studies there. I spent a quick 38 years in the Navy. I got interested in this conversation between Chris and, and Scott Tate, who you'll meet here in a minute. Uh, and then, you know, they really said, hey, Robert, uh, your time in the nuclear submarine force may have some, uh, you know, kind of analog to uh, this uh, conversation in deep space. So that's how I got interested. And I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having us here today. It's really a pleasure and a privilege. I'm Scott Tate. Uh, had the privilege of serving in the Navy for um, 27 years. Uh, of those, about 19 of them were at sea or overseas, and I now uh, now work with the Admiral there at UC San Diego doing a little bit of teaching. I run a national security innovation program there, and I'm the CEO of a company called Civic Science and Engineering, where we design human-machine interfaces for uh, high-consequence systems. And Scott, what about, what a little bit, tell us a little bit more about your Navy experience. What do you actually were doing in the Navy? <laughs> Most of my friends say it was 27 years of undetected crime, but the, uh, <laughs> Professional specialty was surface warfare. So I was on surface ships, mostly cruiser destroyer type surface ships um, deployed pretty much everywhere in the world. All right, thanks. Uh, and so as we started this conversation, uh, it all kind of arose from this uh, uh, interesting idea that as we look at deep space and we look for analogs and where lessons can be learned, of course, there's been missions in Antarctica and places like that. Um, it, it seemed to me or seemed to several of us that uh, you know, maritime history going back hundreds and hundreds of years, back to the early explorers, uh, up to modern, uh, modern history, and certainly the experience of submarines uh, that go underwater for two and a half, uh, three months, depending upon their, this exact type of sub, also served, could serve as a really interesting uh, guidepost uh, about uh, some of the things that these crews may be facing. Uh, while we're, it's very different, obviously, being in orbit at the same time, uh, seafaring uh, uh, missions and, and captains and crews have faced historically many of the same kind of problems in terms of the unknown and, and things like that. So um, wanted to do that. Also, just to remind everybody, you can ask uh, questions uh, as the webinar goes along and we'll get those and, and put those into the it, as many of those as we can into the conversation. So feel free at any point to go ahead and, and use the chat to, to answer a, a question. So uh, again, thank everybody for their time. Let me, let us, I wanna start out by just having a conversation about um, focusing on kind of the history of, of maritime exploration, going back to some of the early, you know, Magellan and some of the early, early explorers from the very beginning, uh, and just talking about uh, from your perspective, you know, what were, what were some of the things that, that uh, you think they will, that they were facing that, that certainly have some, some relevance to where we're going on today. I and mean, obviously many of them were literally going out into the unknown, so. Yeah, hey, uh, Chris, I'm gonna uh, turn it over to Scott because I think that the conversation that both of you have had with respect to this idea of seafaring to spacefaring, you know, listening to Scott uh, and his thoughts on Magellan and uncertainty and variables. Why don't we start with Scott and okay. then, uh, we'll leverage off of that. I think you hit on the single biggest thing, right? It was this willingness to head off into the absolute unknown, um, you know, where you didn't know what you were going to face in terms of environment. Um, you didn't know what you were going to face in terms of how long you would be out there, where or how you'd be able to resupply. Um, didn't know if the technology that worked well off your native coast was going to work equally well in these unbeknownst periods. I mean, they used to have maps and anywhere that they didn't know if there was land there or the nature of the ocean, they just put a dragon. Right? People still laugh about here there be dragons, but um, there was just so little that was known in the 14, 1500s that uh, the fact that these folks went out and were able to face adversity and, and overcome seemingly impossible odds uh, to do a lot of this stuff. You know, Magellan, you mentioned, you know, he left with five ships and almost 300 people and one ship and 18 came back uh, and he was not among them. So the, the, you know, the odds were not good in this business. And, and I think if we're realistic, as we look at deep space exploration, um, we're going to have to face the fact that we likely will face similar tragedy, at least early on. 
Yeah, that's that's amazing. People forget about this. Uh, Robert? Yeah, I you know, I would kind of pile on to Scott's uh, thoughts on this. And that is, you know, uh, we're we're now moving from this idea of Earth orbital space and spacecraft kind of aviation around the planet to what looks to me like deep space and space ships and voyaging, which uh, Scott alluded to. And so the, the uncertainty, the amount of variables, the distances and the time that you're out away from anything that looks like uh, a supply chain, uh, that's an incredible challenge. And there's just a huge amount of experience uh, as you, you know, moved from effectively Europe and or Asia uh, around the planet. I would offer that, uh, you know, there was another uh, kind of key point, and this is where uh, Scott and I, we've talked about it a lot, is uh, so then you take that maritime domain, that maritime environment and all the uncertainties, and then, you know, just about 70 years ago, you know, 1955, effectively, you build the first nuclear powered submarine, kind of the first true submersible. Because remember, before that, as people talk about submarines, those are surface ships with ballast tanks, the ability to submerge for short periods of time. But you then build this true submersible. And as we were talking about before the webinar, then you get into long periods of time where you are uh, in an isolated environment, in a tube. You don't have the advantage of going out for a breath of fresh air. You literally have supplies on board and there's no resupply option. And you're into now not just a few days off the coast, but potentially months submerged. Uh, and we mentioned the USS Triton circumnavigating the globe. That looks to me, you know, from a simplistic perspective, as a reasonable analog to examine some of these uh, issues that uh, not just the Newtonian mechanics of the space travel, but the more interestingly, all those human factors. That, that you and Scott have talked about as far as uh, spacefaring. Mm -hmm. I'll leave it at that. Okay. First, I guess to jump in on that, you know, I think we chronically, because things like space or seafaring are so technology centric, um, we tend to overlook the importance of culture. And when you look at spacefaring as though it were seafaring, uh, I think when you look at an aviation culture, the thing that characterizes it is this stark separation of operators and maintainers. You got somebody who flies the plane, they land it, they get off, somebody else does all the maintenance work. Uh, it simply doesn't work that way on ships. You know, your, your operators are inherently your maintainers. And consequently, there tends to be a little more culture of self-reliance. Um, and I think that you know, getting to and from the space station even looks a lot like aviation, but being on the space station looks a lot more like being out in the maritime. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, uh, I mean, in both cases, both your cases, certainly Robert as a, you know, on a submarine, you know, being submerged for two and a half, three months uh, issues. And, and Scott, I know from what I've learned from you and Rachel talking to you is that you know, even on the destroyers, you know, while you're not underwater, you're often in the middle of nowhere for, for months and months and months. Uh, and, and having, while there are certainly things that are, are dissimilar from space, uh, what are some of the things that you've, uh, you think are, are uh, some of the most challenging that you face uh, from a standpoint of the crew uh, and yourselves in, in those kind of situations? Let's start with Scott, and then we'll go to Robert and talk about submarines a little bit. Well, um, you know, the uncertainty of what's happening with your family. That's Rachel. Excuse me. Hey, Rachel. Hi. Hi, everybody. Good, good to have you on. You Just before we start, go ahead and just quickly introduce yourself to bring you up to speed. Yes. Hi, everybody. My name is Rachel Costello, and I am a 30-year Navy veteran. 
and currently teaching uh, Hacking for Defense at University of California in San Diego. And we're very thrilled to be uh, joining this. Webinar. And you Thank spent you. some time with Tesla, right? Oh, yes, 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 <laughs> yes. I spent four and a half years at Tesla. Started out when it was 4,000 people. Uh, and obviously, it's now like 38,000 plus, very much like a Navy. But uh, it's been, it was really exciting experience working there. Okay, great. Well, thanks. Glad you could join us. Uh, so we're just talking a little bit about um, some of the challenges that both destroyers, surface ships, and, and, and submarines and the crews face there. So Scott, go ahead. Sure, and we should note in Rachel's biography that she was a command master chief. So the senior enlisted person on, on the ship or in the squadron that's responsible for kind of being the den mother to all the, the sailors. Um, yeah, I, when I started in the Navy, everything was still mail and the mail came to us by whatever supply ship they could put it on. So you'd have to number your letters. So you get one letter that would be like number five and it would be, hey, the car's fixed. And then letter three would show up two months later and you'd find out how the car got damaged in the first place. Right. So the having better communications today hasn't necessarily resolved those problems. There's still a ton of stress from people being gone, but and feeling helpless um, to helpless to, to work with people that they care about back ashore. Um, Keeping people motivated and making sure that they have their eye on the on the, the long term goal, so that they aren't completely uh, distracted by the problems of the day, uh, and then fatigue. You know, fatigue is always a, a big issue because you know, people think that you're on a ship, you're floating around, maybe you're bored. Um, most of those people that are out there, and I, I assume most people in space, are, are working incredibly long hours because they have to not only do the operations, but the maintenance, keep up their training and do other things. So I say the, the average sailor works 18 hours a day when they're at sea. Um, so, you know, both physical and, and mental fatigue do tend to set in. Rachel, do you want to add anything to that before we go to Robert? Sure. I yes. What Scott just mentioned or reminded brought back a lot of memories of um, having to ensure the quality of life of sailors aboard. On the ship that um, when we were on, I would say that maybe 60% of the sail or sailors and officers were under the age of 35. So that's important as we think about the crew, the type of crew that we taking this long voyage in space to make sure that they have the, um, the tools and mental health. And um, obviously physical activity is required to keep them resilient through the long voyage. Right. So Robert, um, a little bit different, obviously uh, in a submarine, you guys are underwater, uh, which I thought is kind of interesting as, a, as again, as an analog for deep space, because in a sense you share some of the same experiences that people in space will will share so what's what's uh, what are some of the the challenges observations that you you guys faced well as scott and rachel mentioned uh, one of the things that uh in you know i'll, I'll use the u.s navy and the u.s uh, nuclear submarine force uh you're fighting for sleep this fatigue issue is um a, a huge deal. And that's, and it's going to be very, very interesting as you um, move to deep space in these potentially months long voyages, uh, how much automation versus uh, how much kind of manual maintenance and involvement of the crew in the actual maintaining of the ship uh, will be involved. Um, because of the legacy of Hyman G. Rickover, nuclear submarine crews to this day, despite a lot of automated capability, um, absolutely are hands-on with respect to maintenance. And uh, so as, as Scott and Rachel mentioned, it's this, it's this effectively an 18-hour day, and then you're trying to fit in six hours of sleep and and oh, by the way, while you're doing this, and I would imagine this will be true for a deep space mission, the crew is going to practice, hey, what happens if something goes wrong? So on a ship or a submarine, um, you practice casualty responses. Hey, what if this goes wrong? And then you run a drill and all of these things. 
Um, so it, it's it's absolutely constant. Uh, the other thing that's that's so different between a submarine and a surface ship is, uh, for the most part, uh, you know, surface ships you can sneak off and and uh, you know maybe get a breath of fresh air. Uh, smoke a cigarette on the fantail. I'm not even sure that's allowed in the U.S. Navy anymore. Um, but on a submarine, that's not an option. You find people lining up to get into the control room just so they can occasionally see what's outside if you're up at periscope depth. Otherwise, your lines of sight are very, very short. And when you do that for a long period of time, it absolutely affects how you think, and that must be uh, what crews in space face all the time. You know, Scott mentioned the International Space Station. You know, what's the longest line of sight they have is a few feet. And uh, and then I'll I'll put one more factor in there, and that is, um, you know, you do fight for sleep, uh, but you also fight for some distraction. And uh, on a submarine, a nuclear submarine, food becomes entertainment. And that's not necessarily a good thing, <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, I think you just, yeah, just interrupt. I mean, I think what's interesting in our conversations, you, I asked you one time, you know, what's the, most, what's the most important thing once you do crew selection and training and all those kinds of things you're underwater uh, in maintaining kind of the morale and, and uh, you know, positive disposition of the crew. And you said food. Absolutely. You know, if you've got, uh, as the Navy uh, would say, as, as Rachel would remind me, if you have good chow, that is a key uh, to morale. And, and, and I don't know how you're going to deal with that in a deep space mission. You know, how many meals can you eat out of a tube before it just drives well, you crazy? I think the other thing is, and I'm sure it's more so with, I'll ask Rachel and Scott too, but I mean, even on submarines, um, uh, I mean, a lot of the stuff you make, I, mean, I was surprised to learn, you know, they have big freezers and things like that. And you're able to carry enough food for what, two, two and a half months on the tax subs and things like that. And on destroyers. So th these, these, cause I think this is a really important issue. So these, the, the food that's being served, one is being quote, you know, prepared by chefs uh, on board that may have been trained. And I assume that's the same on, on the destroyers. Uh, and you know, that, uh, I think when we get into how important that is on these on these missions, and we look at the history of food for humans and life forms, I think that becomes a really, really big, big kind of gorilla in the room, because that's not going to be in the early stages of space exploration. Uh, you know, everything's still going to be weight and mass and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and so that's not going to be, um, you know, that's not going to be, be possible. And I'm just wondering, several people have kind of alluded to this. Uh, on some of the questions, you know, how, you know, given the importance of that, seems like that's going to be a, that's going to be a, 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 a pretty big stumbling block, because I don't think it's realistic to think that, on um, you know, on a five to seven, five to six and a half mission to Mars, uh, how even on the early missions, whether you land on the planet or you circumnavigate, you come back, you're looking at two and a half, three year missions, um, you know, you're not going to be able to, people are not going to be able to just survive on nutritional needs. I, I couldn't agree more. I think that um, you are going to have the, the other factor there is, you know, Scott and Rachel will tell you that, um, hey, you don't have time to get bored <laughs> because you're maintaining or you're working on casualty response. And so I think along with the food issue, uh, just how much you automate versus how much you have this crew on this potential mission to Mars, get involved in the actual operation of the, I'll call it a spaceship, I say spacecraft. Yeah. I think that's going to be a, a key decision. Scott, I agree. And I don't think there's any way we're going to be able to anticipate everything they're going to need. So you know, my, my orbital physics may be jacked up and this may be impossible, but I would think you'd want to launch, you know, starting several years before you launch the humans, you would want to launch unmanned pods that have key sets of equipment um, that would give you the opportunity to kind of rendezvous with one of these things while you're on your way there and on your way back. Um, and inside those pods, you could have some things that would lead to better morale. You know, you mix up some fun things, surprise presents, food, 
things that may not they may not always have completely fresh stuff but you could you know certainly increase the amount of time time that they had for us stuff if they were um being able to dock with these things and take new stores aboard as they progress towards and then back rachel i know you had a lot of interaction with the crews yeah i think giving um giving the crew a sense of choice there may not be a choice in a lot of things within their um daily lives on, on the spaceship but giving them choice like a type of food that they could have or on um, type of recreation they could get engaged in. Um, they'll go a long way of uh, keeping morale up. And also as Robert and Scott would, one of the, their key um, value to me as Command Master Chief was having a very set sense of mission, what, what our value was to the mission itself and what each of us brought to the table the success of the crew and the mission is very important too. So I think crew selection, I think is also a key part of it. And I know Chris, you and I talked about, well, what if there was like a one gender crew? Right. Yeah, that's something definitely to be um, be considered. Yeah, in the case we talked about, it actually was brought up by a former, in a former webinar we had, one of the people from, uh, uh, actually one of the space professionals said, you know, that there's indication that, you know, the female astronauts consume a lot less resources than the males, and so that raised raised an interesting question about, you know, we I, I know we I know given Western civilization that that we always assume the mix is going to be, you know, seventy five percent males and 30 percent females, but maybe it's you know maybe it's the it's the opposite of that, uh, given that. So what about what about so let's talk a little bit about that. Um, what about the whole issue of the, and the issues we just talked about talking about the. Uh, some of the issues that get into, you know, obviously you've got um, uh, crews with males and females on them. I just, I'm sure, I'm sure these missions, deep space missions, will will have the same as they do now. Yeah, I, uh, Chris, I, I'm probably a little bit of an outlier here. I think the first mission that you do in deep space. It's all about reducing the number of variables, reducing the uncertainty. And, and so you may want to, um, in this case, because of weight issues and resource issues, you may want to go with an all female crew. And uh, you're obviously, I would think, going to have some medical personnel uh, on board, and therefore, you know, if you could reduce the variables as far as uh, gender-related medical issues, um, and then in follow-on missions, kind of expand uh, your options, your crew options. Um, yeah, I, you know, I know that sounds, you know, culturally like it's going to be a tough pull. Um, I can't imagine all the lawsuits when, you know, NASA or somebody else comes out and says, yeah, it's going to be an all female crew for the first trip to Mars. But um, I, I actually think that's the one way to, to control the variables uh, on your first round. What about several questions? I'm, some of the questions, uh, one question came in talking about, um, to, you know, we talk about growing food on these missions. Is, I, I assume that there's not much growing. Are there any growing food on in, of, in, any surface or subsurface vehicles? Not on purpose. <laughs> okay. But Scott? No, occasionally a, a fish call where people can throw in a line, but uh, not That's growing anything it. on board. All right. Um, also, um, I want to talk a little bit about. I think the, I think the issue that that Robert raised on, on you know the, the mix of crews is, is a really interesting just because it's I think it raises some really interesting issues uh, uh, about how these how these uh, initial missions are going to be uh, going to be structured. I'd like to talk a minute about because uh, I think this is another big issue. Well, let me back up. But you know, one of the things I think interesting that I at least hear from. Uh, a number of people who know a lot about more about space and deep space than, than certainly I have experienced or know, you know, actually one of the things they bring up is a, a concern over boredom uh, that perhaps un, unlike a ship, uh, a lot of it's going to be automated. Uh, 
you know, there's not going to be uh, uh, the kinds of maybe labor intensive uh, types of things that are going on all the time. Uh, and do you see, I mean, so that apparently you don't face that, but that would, that obviously that could be a, a challenge if in fact there was uh, somehow we would have to factor in how do we deal with that time, downtime, entertainment, other other kinds of things, a uh, form of, of keeping people engaged. My, my sense is that virtual reality is going to be a real lifesaver, um, both in terms of being able to let them virtually experience being back on earth and seeing things you know, when they're out there. As somebody had put in the comments there, right? At least on the ISS, you can look out the cupola and see the earth and, and you have some sense of change. Right. But when you're further away, you won't have that, um, you know, both for entertainment and for other purposes. My, my sense is that you know, VR would be a great way to start. Yeah, I, um, this is why I'm, you know, I, I sound like a dinosaur here, but I think that, um, the amount of crew involvement in the spaceship, in the vehicle, uh, has to be carefully thought out. In fact, you know, Scott and Rachel are very used to this. Uh, in the United States Navy, you have this uh, system called the Preventive Maintenance System, Chris. And uh, the running joke uh, amongst the crew is that you'll take a perfectly good piece of equipment. It's operating just fine. And because there's this schedule that says you're supposed to shut it down, take it apart, replace some part that may be a consumable, and then try to put it back together and see if it'll work again. <laughs> That's um, it, it's, it's time consuming uh, it absolutely, though, goes back to Scott and Rachel's original point, which is the crew is definitely involved in maintaining uh, the ship. Um, I, I do worry about that when you're talking about, what, four, five months? Well, one way. One way. Just to get there. Just then, you got, there. Then, you got, then you got five, six months coming back. Coming and whatever back. time you serve either on the planet as an early mission or circumnavigating it like an Apollo and then coming back, you're probably talking at least two and a half, three, three plus years. Yeah. So I, I do think that that is a, a huge issue. And, um, you know, Scott's point about virtual reality, I think is important. Again, having something tangible to do, you know, and then back to Rachel's point, okay, why are we doing this? Right. If they don't, have some kind of overarching mission like hey the purpose here is to move off planet and go to mars and figure out how to live and use that as a lily pad for even deeper space exploration i mean if they don't have that kind of drilled into their baked into their dna then i think this boredom issue is a, a real problem I want to circle back to another big issue that I think that uh, is interesting that several people have raised. Uh, uh, one is, well, so a couple of people have raised the issue that on ships, obviously, on you know, there's, the crews are quite large. Uh, obvious, obviously, in these initial missions, uh, deep space missions, they're going to be relatively small. Uh, and so of, instead, how many people, uh, Robert, how many people on a, how many crew on a sub, nuclear attack sub? Yeah, nuclear attack sub, about 140 people. Scott, Rachel, what about a surface ship i think with a detachment we had at one point we had 300 um sailors and officers on a crew at this yeah usually 250 to 400 is a good bet okay for this so what are your what are your observations obviously you don't know but just if you're looking at you know 10 people as on a three three and a half year mission three two and a half as opposed to obviously 150 or two or 300 is that present problems? Is it an opportunity? How, what are you, what are your, your sense of that? That would really begin again. I'll have to anchor in a crew selection. Yeah. And do you, um, do you have people that have relationships with each other or potential 
for relationships with each other because that, especially over a two and a half, three year mission, that will be a very interesting uh, either challenge or can you leverage that? And, and Chris, I think, you know, early on, this is probably not as big a problem because you'll be dealing with very elite crews that have trained together as you start to commercialize this, though, and you're talking larger numbers of people that aren't, you know, <laughs> simple fact, they aren't going to be able to be as selective and, and have as much training. And this becomes a more, you know, a routine human endeavor. I think there, there is where your problem starts to come in. I mean, it brings us to another interesting topic. Um, a lot of people... Uh, you know, have, have uh, in, in recent years have their experience with space other than, uh, uh, you know, NASA and some of the, you know, SpaceX, some of the things that are going on have been things like Star Trek and, you know, things of that nature. And it's always a certain camaraderie that seems to exist. I want to talk about discipline. Uh, several people have raised the issue of, you know, exactly you know, in a, in a situation like this, where you're looking at two and a half, three years, and you're looking at 10, 12, eight people, whatever the, the side, the crew size is, is appropriate. Um, uh, you know, how you guys, both, I mean, all of you, uh, Robert, Scott, Rachel, I mean, what's, what's your sense of how are things, you know, how is discipline in your observation, how did discipline uh, basically transpire on, on your, on your, your ships and what's, you know, what, what we might extrapolate for that. Obviously, because all of you have been on, well, my, my not in combat, they are warships. So you are in a situation where you're out, you just weren't out, you know, sightseeing or fishing or uh, taking tourists. So there was a there was a, a, a real focus. So what what's your what's your sense there? Rachel, you probably ought to start this off <laughs> since you were a deck plate disciplinarian. Again, it, it starts with the, uh, the commanding officer's guidance. Or, or the whoever the mission commander is, but but I guess in a space NASA case, I, I would think that that the mission commander would be responsible for providing guidance. Or would that be NASA? That'd be my first question. And then two, um, the crew just need to know what the what the left and right limits are. Um, mm -hmm. And at first point of any um, discipline issue needs to be addressed. Um, yeah. I had a friend once tell me who was involved in space. I don't know if this is true. He said, you know, he said on the early uh, exploration ships, there was not literally, but he said, you know, there are two things that are always on board. Uh, you know, one was, uh, uh, you know, uh, a mess hall of some sort and the other was a brig. Uh, and so how do you, I mean, I'm sure you've encountered or potentially encountered situations and what do you do? Like, what do you do? You're, you're you know, you're a year and a half into a mission. Uh, and you've got uh, issues that come up in terms of command and control. Sure. Uh, you know, command and control will obviously have to be established. Somebody's got to be in charge. Um, we One of the reasons that ship captains, submarine captains, have extraordinary legal authority uh, in handling justice is a, is a recognition of the fact that, you know, you're not able to tap into civilian courts, you're not able to do these other things, and you must maintain good order and discipline. You know, again, I think early on when you've got very elite crews and small numbers of them, um, you're, they're going to be so handpicked that it probably won't be an issue. Um, but as you start to democratize this, uh, and certainly as you get more and more um, commercial activity and civilians going up doing things, yeah, it's going to have to come into play. Robert, what's some of that like uh, judicial authority that you have that Scott talked about? Yeah, so you um, actually have this in the U.S. Navy as a commanding officer. We froze up here for a second. Still there? Chris, can you hear me? I don't know. Scott, uh, Rachel, can you guys hear me? Give me a thumbs no. up. I can hear you. I think Chris is frozen. Okay. Um, so for the webinar participants, if um, you can still hear me, there's this uh, concept called non-judicial punishment. Literally, uh, the commanding officer of a ship uh, with a recommendation from the command master chief um, has this option to quote, award punishment. And it is not a legal proceeding. It has some trappings that make it sound a little more legal than it is. 
But it is this point that Scott made and Rachel made that you're out there alone and you don't have the option for uh, a civil suit or a criminal uh, justice case uh, to go through courts. So you have to handle it on your own. Uh, to Scott's point, I think uh, early on, hey, small crews, they're elite. Uh, other than a, you know, unforeseen mental health issue, which would lead to some behavioral problem over this three-year period, it would be hard to kind of conjure up how a disciplinary issue would come up. Uh, like the potential spaceship that would go to a place like Mars, submarines uh, are confined in space, so you have no break. If you have somebody midway through a two and a half month submerged period that uh, behaves badly, um, especially if it could be a mental health related issue, you literally have to sedate them and you know, keep the, a watch on them in a birthing compartment where people sleep because you have no space. And so uh, that would be an analog for, you know, what a, uh, a spacecraft or spaceship might, might encounter. Uh, but again, um, you absolutely have to have somebody in charge, as, as, as Rachel said, and I can't imagine it being an issue early on, but as you get larger and larger crews, and, and as Scott mentioned, as you democratize this, uh, behavior problems are going to be uh, something to deal with two, three years. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things, too, that, that I think, you know, we, we, do, I, we talk about elite crews and crew selection and all the different things that people talk about. And I think that we all under, you know, realize that. I think the one thing, well, the couple of things that make this so different uh, and you know, unprecedented and we can't test for is there's, you know, all, you know, all humans have evolved, all life form and humans have evolved over, you know, hundreds of millions, billions of years uh, uh, with basically a couple of things that have, a lot of things have changed, but two things have remained constant. One is our, you know, you know basically existing and evolving and existing as a part of nature, which is going to be going to be separated here. In fact, somebody, one of the people wrote one of the questions was, you know, well, I think you say, you know, when you're in space, you're not going to, you know, even, you know, on ISS going to the moon on ISS, the astronauts can look out the window, they can see the earth, uh, they can see, you know, those things are all going to be gone on a deep space mission. And I remember Scott Hubbard with NASA who was on a previous uh, webinar with us who heads up the Solar System Institute at NASA, you know, indicated that when you enter into deep space, you know, basically, there's going to be no sense of motion. Uh, you're not going to see, other than a, a, you know, a, a disappearing Earth and a star here and there. You're not going to see anything, and you're not going to really have any 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 sense of motion. Of course, the other big thing is which you know we don't really know. We talk about how crews are going to react, and I don't see it, but we have no idea how humans are going to react after two to three years of zero g. And we don't know neurologically. We really don't know, and I'm not. You know, not suggesting it's a problem, it's not a problem. But I think those two factors are, are things that are overlooked a lot. I know I've talked to several people who've been on Mars analogs in the Arctic and things, and they talk about, um, one of the things they talk interestingly is, you know, after a, after a week, uh, you know, it, everything becomes pretty contentious over food, number one. Uh, and two uh, is, uh, you know, this whole, you know, this whole, but again, they're under, you know, they're, they assume they have windows, they can still look out and see the snow and they're under in one G. So th I think those unknowns really, really complicate what we, what we understand and what we might, might expect. So I think anything is possible. Absolutely. You mentioned this uh, sense of motion, you know, for Scott and Rachel um, on surface ships, you have a constant <laughs> sense of motion, you know, complements of wave action and everything else. Um, in a submarine, uh, especially when you're submerged, uh, life is very good, even when it's ugly up on the surface. If you're at 400 feet 
and you're just cruising along, you can kind of lose that sense of motion. Interestingly enough, what you uh, start to relate to, Chris, and this may happen with uh, people in deep space, is you relate to sound. And what I mean by that is you're used to hearing the hum, that 400 hertz <laughs> kind of hum of machinery. And um, it becomes uh, actually kind of soothing in a way. And when it disappears, when a sound changes with all your other senses kind of eliminated, uh, you know something's wrong. I don't you know, have any experience in what it would be like to be in a spacecraft or spaceship uh, because there may be no sound. Right. So not only can't I see out to sense motion, I can't hear anything. There's no hum in the spaceship. That would, uh, again, I think, I'll, I'll defer to Scott and Rachel, I think that will be a real challenge over a long period of time. A lot of what we're discussing goes back to sensory deprivation and the impact it has on humans over time. And I, I assume that there's a body of knowledge out there, maybe not over the extended periods that we're talking about, but certainly there's got to be uh, people we could draw on. And, um, you know, we, we kind of make it up in the military. I don't know that we've ever really studied these things. Uh, and somebody put in the comments that military may not be a good analog, and I, I agree with that. So that just a reminder that we're really talking about the maritime world and the types of platforms that operate on our own ocean, on and under our oceans, being a good analog for operating in deep space more than um, the military per se. Yeah, somebody mentioned that talked about the Vikings and uh, you know the Polynesians and the and and in, uh, in the Pacific, you know that that ventured off into these ex true exploration that weren't weren't military. Uh, and I think that's a good that's a that's a really good point. Um, Rachel, anything you want to add in on this conversation? Yeah, I think the um, as far as the sensory deprivation, having some sort of a, um, a oral music like there's an app called Endel. That's real popular. It allows you to kind of focus on your work or it gives you just background noise to allow you to focus on what you're doing. I would think there'd be something like that available um, for consideration to combat the sensory deprivation. Um, the sailors on the ship I was on, obviously, their way um, to keep themselves entertained when they're not working was an Xbox. Um, but, you know, everybody, we allowed them to wear um, headphones if it's not in no danger to what they were doing or to others. Um, so there is a way to keep, I guess, keep some sort of a, um, a sense of having, I guess, having this stimulation so they don't, they don't go too, um, too stir crazy on long trips. Yeah, interesting. Um, uh, I actually know someone, I think I may have mentioned in one of our previous conversations uh, who I've started to talk with who uh, basically, um, Actually, his background is in philosophy, literature, and neurology, uh, neuroscience. And, and he actually, among other things, actually has been called upon to train uh, military and special forces uh, about this whole issue of how do you stay in the zone in a mission? Uh, how do you, you know, take tools and things that you can, you can deploy? And so I think that's, that's some of what uh, I think Rachel's been referring to, which she keeps talking about the mission, you know, you know, mission, all of you, mission, very mission focused and getting people who really absolutely buy in, you know, buy into that. The other thing we talk about, was, you know, we've talked and kind of alluded to, I think the other thing that's really interesting, uh, and I thought this would be an, actually an interesting conversation to have with people uh, as well, a group of people, is all the things that we as humans uh, are going to potentially miss if we imagine a, a, a three years going and coming, you know, all the things that potentially would impact us. I know someone, um, uh, uh, Tiffany Vora, actually, who is uh, part of the Humanity and Deep Space team, has been on a couple of analog missions. And I remember her telling me the thing she missed the most after a couple of weeks was breeze on her face. Uh, and you think of those kinds of things and things like smells. You know, we talk about food, smell, taste, texture, how, you know, we have no, I, I don't think anybody really knows, are we going to be able to in any way replicate any of that? And if not, 
uh, you know, some of the challenges that those are those things are going to face, you know, crews are going to face because you can certainly begin to, th I'm sure we could make a long list if we started to think about all the things that you might, small things, forget the big things, you might miss, it would be a real challenge for you. Sure. I, I think that uh, one you've talked about before, Chris, in previous conversations is just that day night cycle. One of the things that we found, uh, you know, in the submarine business is that uh, we absolutely were um, having problems, long-term performance problems because of our, you know, we just discarded this circadian rhythm idea mm -hmm. and we went to this 18 hour day, right? So you, you basically, you know, you said, all right, I'm in a submarine. There's no sun, whatever. Um, and we, we did that for years. And then we had some people who understood uh, much better than we did, frankly, the human performance issues. And when we started going back and changing our rhythms to a day-night cycle, even though we had to kind of you know, present this as an artificiality, which is you would have to do in space, that that was an important kind of uh, ligature for uh, human beings uh, to operate long periods of time uh, without um, what you and I would consider a normal rhythm. Any other thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, Scott, one of the things that, that I, I surprised me when we were talking earlier, uh, 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 I, I had mentioned to you, I said, well, I'm like, a, you know, gee, I guess it's easier on a, uh, on a, on a surface ship because unlike a sub, you guys can come up, they can go on deck and et cetera. And you said something to me that I thought was very interesting and something I didn't expect. You said there's quite a bit of the crew sometimes that never comes up on deck. Is that true? Yeah. And, you know, so you mentioned having 200 people versus a smaller crew. It's, you know, you might have a crew of 200, but when they're at sea, they're basically going from their workplace to their eating place and back to their, their bed. So they're likely only interacting with a handful of that crew on for the majority of their time. And many of them that work below decks go days, if not weeks without going topside and, and, seeing anything other than the, the area they work in or the area they live in. So it is kind of a different phenomenon. Yeah. That really surprised me. I figured they'd all be up on this. Is it as soon as, as soon as they could get up and get some sun, that's where they'd be. Rachel, you nod your head. You go, no, it wasn't that way. Um, you would think that, but again, depends on the age group of the sailors, but um, the carrier I was on, was on um, uh, USS Enterprise and as you know, the aircraft is very, you know, it's 5,000 people, very large. Uh, I spent first two weeks just going from my birthing to uh, the mess hall and then to my office. And, and I didn't go up top side at all because you know, there's combat operations going on all, all, all hours of the day. So it's not really a safe place to be for a young, young or not a, an inexperienced person to be running around there. So it is true that, um, you would think that people could go up there getting this, you know, breeze in the face, but that's not necessarily true. You know, and somebody asked, one of the question that somebody asked me this is, you know, uh, you know, it, it, they can't understand why there hasn't been more work or threat exploration of centrifugal force. You know, we all see these rotating. And I, I know, on our, I, again, I'm not an expert in this, so I could be wrong, but on an earlier webinar, we had some NASA people and some space face professionals. They made the comment that while that is, you know, in terms of, you know, science and physics is possible, Right now, it's it's pro not probably not feasible in terms of uh, technology and cost. Uh, right now, which, which is one reason you don't see more of those kinds of things in the uh, in, in you know in the uh, in the literature or at least going on. Um, any one of the one of the um, interesting comments that just came in actually from Joe Schmidt, who's the NASA flight surgeon who's watching, asked about your ideas about. Um, their thoughts about how to improve terrestrial life in, as spinoffs from what you guys have, what you people have experienced, which is kind of an interesting, interesting take. Your thoughts on that? Oh, uh, sure, Chris. I think, you know, when you look at, you know, 
it's a big topic, but I think space will again find itself analogous to the maritime world, right? Certain civilizations grew up as maritime civilizations and they tended to be more technology oriented. They tend because of trade to be more open to, to other things, other ideas. Uh, I think those nations that pursue spacefaring will be the same thing and they'll see the same type of spinoff. We already see the spinoff from the space programs back into, um, society, you know, with regard to taking maritime experiences and making terrestrial things better. Um, you know, I, I think that has happened all, all over the world. You know, technologies that were developed to go to sea wind up being beneficial ashore. Um, cultural aspects that wind up, that, that are kind of grown in the maritime, wind up transporting well. Uh, you can argue that um, most maritime societies are more free than most non-maritime societies because of that that need to trust people to go over the horizon without being able to directly control them. And I, you know, I think some of the, yeah, you mentioned, what are the, some of the big, what are some of the larger countries that haven't historically haven't been maritime? Well, this is an interesting point, right? I mean, Russia and China pursued space heavily, but were never really maritime powers. Um, China's building a Navy, but they certainly aren't a maritime oriented um, people. They've often seen the, the ocean as a threat rather than an opportunity. Um, so seeing how they approach space and will they will they approach it very differently than those of us for maritime backgrounds is going to be uh, fascinating over the next decades. Yeah, so, um, you know, kind of in academic circles, you would sit there and say, you know, continental versus maritime uh, countries or powers, empires, and uh, those that are uh, the old adage is uh, the maritime powers set the world order. Continental powers contest that order. And um, you're seeing it today in Eastern Europe uh, and other places. Uh, absolutely um, terrestrial oriented, land oriented uh, societies uh, tend to be um, you know, and, and with good reason, you know, they're constantly uh, worried about their own borders. Maritime nations kind of have a bigger view uh, naturally. And I think it'll be very, very interesting uh, to Scott's point, things you've talked about before, Chris, when you actually make deep space a reality, uh, those countries, those, you know, the international community that participates in that, what will be uh, that kind of overlap or how will that feed back to uh, their views about uh, life on earth? I, I find it, you know, that's one of those fascinating aspects. You mentioned something else, and that was the physics of space travel uh, and this issue of zero G let me just kind of return to that for a moment, because sure. my understanding is, you know, uh, you know, unless magic occurs over a very short period of time, this long trip to Mars is effectively projectile motion. And, um, you know, so you're, lo you're looking at, at a lot of time, a lot of distance, and that's why, you know, uh, until the mechanics of it change, these human factors that you're talking about, Chris, are, I think, just so fascinating and, and how you try to uh, anticipate uh, those variables. I think that's going to, you know, and I love the fact that you've got this group of experts uh, that you've collected, especially uh, people with actual uh, space travel experience and, you know, NASA and, and other places. So, um, I just enjoy tagging along with the conversation. Yeah, thank you. Um, one of our viewers said he wants to. Uh, he's an Air Force guy. Says wants to thank his uh, Navy shipmates. So it's. Uh, we I wanted to pass that on. Um, so we're we're just about out of time, but I want to ask one quick question. Just just your perception. Uh, it's it's another big issue. We could spend a, an hour or five hours talking about. And is the the whole just given your background as 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 uh, in the military and experience, uh, you know the whole issue. The one thing we haven't uh, talked about today, because really not the topic, is the whole issue of defense and the militarization of space. And from your standpoint, as as all have served on warships, uh, 
Uh, just what are your, your, we have, you know, we have a space force now and uh, obviously there's a lot of things going on in the world. And I always say, this is, you know, these are just a, a precursor to what's likely to happen in space. I think unless humans stop being humans, as unfortunate as it is, since space kind of represents an opportunity to do things differently, um, I doubt that we will. I think we'll see the same sort of competition and military competition in space that we've seen here on Earth. I hate to be a downer, but... Yeah, I, I, I agree. Uh, sapiens being what they are with a, at least a 70,000-year recorded history of finding ways to kill each other and break things, um, you know, this is a, a much larger domain and uh, I think a lot of the experts who are uh, listening in on the webinar or, or, you know, commenting, you know, have already seen the militarization of space over the last 60 years. So uh, I'd like to use wishful thinking as a, a future way of doing business, but I'm just, I'm discouraged in that regard. Rachel, any? That's something you can't avoid. Obviously, having a deterrent, some sort of deterrence against any um, right. aggression to be feasible. But, um, I guess from a military standpoint, is space kind of the ultimate higher ground? In well, like, again, Chris, I think if you look at the development of maritime law, there's a, a good analog there, right? Mm -hmm. There are areas that are beyond the, the reach of law, and then there's a whole body of specialty law that pertains just to the maritime because of the unique physical characteristics. So I, I would expect that we would have a body of space law developed that would be analogous. Okay. Well, we're out of time. Uh, I want to thank everybody. This has been great. We've had lots of questions. We couldn't get to all of them, but they've all, several people have really expressed uh, uh, their appreciation for the three of you and how interesting it's been dealing with, having hearing from three people who have had to deal with very isolating and, and, and uh, difficult situations uh, and environments. And so I really appreciate it. I wanted to, first of all, uh, before we go, uh, thanks for the sponsors, Kentucky Science Technology Corporation, National Stem Cell Foundation, uh, the uh, Virtual Solar System Institute at NASA Ames, Children Center, Baird Space Tango, START program at the University of Kentucky, uh, which is funded by NIH, uh, 22 Solutions Media Collaboratory and Higher Orbits. And again, thank you, uh, Robert, Scott, and Rachel. It's been a great conversation, and we really appreciate your time. And so... Uh, all of you uh, who are who are have uh, registered, you should be on our website. You should be on our database. You'll get you'll get information about other kinds of events coming up in the next webinar. Uh, and so, uh, please uh, keep your eye out for that. And if you have any other thoughts or questions or ideas you want to send to us, please do uh, by going to our website in Humanity and Deep Space and to the comments section and let us know. Uh, again, uh, Chris Kimmel, and thank you all very much. <laughs>